Mark got his PhD at Columbia in 1985, and he spent a couple of years as research director at NACLA before he uh, went to, uh, for a job at uh, the Yale University Department of Anthropology in 1987. And in 1994, Mail committed one of its many missteps from which we have fortunately benefited when they let Mark go. Mark got a job at Hunter, and he's been uh, basically attached to Hunter ever since, although he's had a series of uh, uh, visits at uh, the School of uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies, various other places along the way. Uh, and he's partly, he's uh, between Hunter and the Graduate Center, so I think he's got uh, positions in both places. Marx published uh, two single-authored books, The Logic of the Latifundio, The Largest States of Northeastern Costa Rica, uh, since the late 19th century, was published by Stanford in 1992. I believe that was Marx's dissertation. It's a, a weighty tome, to, to put it mildly. And I think Mark, Mark is much better known for what I really consider a magisterial piece, Peasants Against Globalization, which appeared in 1999, and then also for the uh, Blackwell volume, The Anthropology of Development and Globalization from Classical Political Economy to Contemporary Neoliberalism, which he co-edited with Angelique Hagaru. Along the way, he's published uh, more than 70 articles, many translated into Spanish. In fact, it's, it's very impressive, Mark's effort to disseminate his work in languages other than English. Uh, and al along with that, numerous commentaries, journalistic pieces, that is, uh, newspaper articles, and book reviews. Uh, his work focuses on uh, transnational social movements, uh, land grabbing, food security, uh, many, many issues that have to do with rural social economy. And I think many of us have been eagerly awaiting uh, this most recent publication that is going to be coming out uh, soon, The Political Dynamics of Transnational Agrarian Movements that Mark is that's currently under contract and due to appear in the near future in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese, among others. Uh, I don't know how many other languages uh, are intended. Uh, Mark, you may not be aware, is a first-class <laughs> one tour. I mean, it's, I hope that people have had the opportunity to be regaled with some of his uh, stories of his travels, uh, when he, uh, especially those on, uh, when he was on a, a NACLA mission in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, uh, he tells these things with a phenomenal dry wit that will uh, crack you up, to say the least. <laughs> and today he will regale us with a talk on food sovereignty, forgotten genealogies, and future regulatory challenges. Mark Ellen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lee, for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, I have the feeling after that that it's downhill from here. Um, before entering into the paper itself, I think it's probably a good idea to say a few words about the context in which it was written. I prepared the paper for a conference on food sovereignty, a critical dialogue, which was held at Yale in September. The event brought together some 250 scholars and activists, many of whom are advocates of or sympathetic, at least, to the idea of food sovereignty, as well as many who are skeptical. Since I was to some extent in the latter camp, I sought to disarm them with what I imagined uh, would be uh, a useful epigraph from the late Albert Hirschman, one of my uh, favorite social scientific theorists, uh, and also an exemplary human being, and one who I think we probably don't read as much as we should in this program. The idea of the Yale Conference was to foster a productive dialogue on the concept of food sovereignty, and this indeed seems to have occurred, so much so that there will be a second iteration of the conference with more European participation in The Hague in January. Because the paper was originally written for an audience thoroughly familiar, or at least it believed itself thoroughly familiar, with the concept of food sovereignty, and with the social movements around it, <laughs> the text assumes a certain amount of background that this audience here today may not have. So I'll say just a few things to situate the discussion. First, the history of food sovereignty 
has become inseparable from the rise since the late 1980s of transnational agrarian movements, particularly Via Campesina, a network of peasant and small farmer organizations that now has affiliates in some 70 countries and a rising international profile. The London Guardian recently referred to Via Campesina as today arguably the world's largest social movement. One could always quibble with such an assessment, but it does suggest that we are dealing with a phenomenon of very considerable significance in the world of social change activism. Through a series of serendipitous historical and biographical accidents, I had the good fortune of spending a lot of time in the late 1980s and early 1990s with several of the rural activists in Costa Rica, Honduras, and Nicaragua who participated in the founding of Via Campesina the other founders of which came from places as diverse as Canada, the Basque country, the Philippines, Brazil, France, and India. So the Central American prehistory of this movement was very much part of my lived fieldwork experience. And eventually, as we'll see, this led me to question a certain inventing of tradition that became part of the movement's origin story. I'll make one final point about context which echoes a lament expressed in New Haven by Mamadou Goita, the executive secretary of ROPA, the network of peasants and farmers in Francophone West Africa. Food sovereignty is not just a demand of Via Campesina, even though a lot of people, including many Via Campesina activists, seem to think it is. Many other social movements, some transnational and some very local, subscribe to one or another version of food sovereignty. Coalitions such as the International Planning Committee on Food Sovereignty or the Nieleni Forum include dozens or even hundreds of other movements, including fisher folk and pastoralists and NGOs, and are much bigger than Via Campesina, which also participates in these umbrella groups. The problem then is not the enthusiasm for the food sovereignty concept, but rather the lack of specification that attaches to it. It is possible that deliberately cultivating ambiguity can be a source of strength, but it also, I believe, has certain limitations. Now for the paper itself. Since the mid-1990s, food sovereignty has emerged as a powerful mobilizing frame for social movements, a set of legal and quasi-legal norms and practices aimed at transforming food and agriculture systems and a free-floating signifier filled with various kinds of content. It is at once a slogan, a paradigm, a mix of practical policies, a movement, and a utopian aspiration. As a banner or frame, it contributed to the formation of broad-based transnational coalitions, such as the People's Coalition on Food Sovereignty, based mainly in Asia, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, involved in pressuring the FAO since 2002, the Nieleni Forum, which includes Via Campesina and various other coalitions of peasants, pastoralists, and fisher folk. It has been the subject of region, regional presidential summit meetings, as in Managua, Nicaragua in 2008, as a set of policy prescriptions, measures intended to enhance food sovereignty run the gamut from relatively conventional types of protectionism to innovative forms of linking small-scale small producers and consumers. Food sovereignty has been incorporated into legal norms, sometimes at the level of national constitutions, and a growing number of nation states, including Venezuela, Senegal, Mali, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Nepal, and Bolivia, and also in localities. Some civil society organizations have sought to institutionalize food sovereignty at the international level through an international convention that would supersede and obviate multilateral free trade agreements. This paper acknowledges right up front that the idea of food sovereignty has gained extraordinary traction and it has contributed in numerous ways and in many parts of the world to the realization of a progressive agenda on food and agriculture issues. At the same time, the concept and the way it is typically understood have several limitations. The paper cannot and does not pretend to cover the burgeoning literature on food sovereignty. Its objective instead is merely to broaden the discussion by briefly analyzing several dimensions of food sovereignty that thus far have received insufficient attention and that are arguably important in understanding the history of food sovereignty and in advancing food sovereignty policies. <clears throat> 
At the outset, it is important to emphasize that the skeptical observations that follow are offered in a spirit of deep sympathy and solidarity with the Food Sovereignty Project, which can only advance further if its proponents sharpen their critical focus and acknowledge how daunting the challenges are. All social groups have origin stories and myths. These serve to reaffirm shared identities and values, to mobilize and bound collectivities, to define adversaries, and to connect the present to the past. Like other invented traditions, they are not necessarily about accurate historical reconstruction, but instead often serve to legitimize contemporary practices and doctrines. Intellectual and social movements, and not just tribes or other imagined communities, also typically have origin myths. Some of them are almost as fanciful as the tale about how the goddess Minerva was born fully grown from the head of Jupiter, wearing her armor and accompanied by her wise owl. In the case of food sovereignty, the canonical account is repeated more or less the same way in almost every analysis, whether by pro-food sovereignty scholar activists or by skeptics. The following elements recur in most of the now very substantial food sovereignty literature. One, food sovereignty was first discussed by Via Campesina at its second international conference in Tlaxcala, Mexico in 1996. Two, Via Campesina and its allies launched or went public with a call for food sovereignty at the FAO-sponsored World Food Conference in Rome, also in 1996. Three, they juxtaposed food sovereignty to food security, which was seen as a contrary, deficient, and mediocre concept for reasons that will be elaborated below. And finally, the idea and practice of food sovereignty were refined at various international conclaves of peasant and farmer movements and other civil society organizations, including those in Havana in 2001, Rome in 2002, Selenge, Mali in 2007, Mexico City 2012, and so on. A few accounts of the history of food sovereignty provide greater specificity, though not much. Haya Heller, for example, remarks that the precise origin of the term is unclear. She notes, however, that on December 4, 1993, French Union Paysan joined 8,000 other smallholders from across Europe to travel to Geneva, carrying a, that, a banner that for the first time read Souveraineté Alimentaire, food sovereignty. Pardon my French. Uh, speaking of French, uh, or at least Belgian, uh, there's an additional wrinkle to the food sovereignty origin story, which concerns academics who have written on the concept and its regional origins. In October 2012, Olivier de Scooter, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, received a food sovereignty prize awarded by the New York-based NGO Why Hunger. De Scooter began his acceptance keynote to the audience of New Yorkers by remarking, I'll, I'll just show it to you. I won't tell you what he said. I, w I, I am to say a few words to introduce, I guess, the, the prize and what it means and why it's important. And let me begin by, by saying that the first researcher who actually used the concept of food sovereignty is somebody from New York. He is Mark Edelman in a book called Peasants Against Globalization in 1999, where he described food sovereignty as a result of the onslaught on peasants uh, in Costa Rica, um, small food producers in Costa Rica. I, I adore Olivier de Scooter, but he's wrong about that. <laughs> um, not long after he said this, Priscilla Claes, a member of the Special Rapporteur's research team and one of his PhD students, echoed this claim, albeit in less categorical terms, in an article in the journal Sociology and more definitively in a personal communication with the author, with me. Um, <laughs> Edelman had been unable to attend Why Hunger's Food Sovereignty Award event. <laughs> Alerted by a colleague who was present, and who was also present here, uh, he viewed the video of De Scooter's keynote feeling flattered, of course, but also experiencing a certain disbelief, <laughs> since he didn't recall having used food sovereignty in Peasants Against Globalization. Though he did remember that by the late 1980s, peasant activists in Costa Rica occasionally employed the term. 
He first went back to the index of the book and then to field notes and transcriptions of recorded interviews from the late 1980s and 1990s where he found scattered <coughs> references to soberania alimentaria usually in relation to the dumping of U.S. surplus maize which undermined domestic producers. And dumping probably sounds like something you might do in the Gowanus Canal and, and you could but it's also, it's also a term that has uh, a specific meaning in international trade law which is when one country sells in another country uh, commodities at below their cost of production. So it's a major problem for developing country farmers in places where there are imports of subsidized grain from the United States and the European Union particularly. In Central America and especially in Costa Rica, these scattered mentions of food sovereignty occurred and gradually became more frequent in a flow of much more commonly used related terms that peasant movements employed, employed during their apogee in the late 1980s. At least as early as 1988, for example, the term food autonomy was utilized by the more radical Costa Rican peasant groups, such as the Atlantic Region Small Agriculturalists Union, UPAGRA, which was made up mainly of maize producers. UPAGRA was the dominant force in a coalition of peasant movements called the Justice and Development Council, several leaders of which later played key roles in founding Via Campesina. The politically centrist National Union of Small and Medium Agricultural Producers, UPA Nacional, similarly demanded food self-sufficiency and the rejection of the importation of agricultural products at dumping prices and the promotion and the establishment of sovereignty in exports so that these do not concentrate in the hands of transnational companies. Importantly, Central American governments of varying orientations occasionally used similar kinds of language at least as early as the 1960s and very explicitly in the 1980s. In Nicaragua in 1983, for example, the Sandinista government's Ministry of Agricultural Development and Agrarian Reform produced a major strategic framework that viewed food security as access to an adequate quantity and quality of food by the entire population and national self-sufficiency and the supply of food. In 1989, in Costa Rica, the then Minister of Agriculture, an individual generally hostile to the peasant organizations, claimed to back the policy of self-sufficiency in rice and other basic grains. Another important source of food sovereignty talk was the food security training program funded by the European community, which held seminars in Panama for peasant activists from throughout Central America in late 1990 and 1991. This followed a related food security program that focused on empirical research in the different countries of the region. While the abundant documentary materials these programs produced contained few, if any, mentions of soberania alimentaria, the peasants who returned from the seminars sometimes began to use the term, although often almost interchangeably with seguridad alimentaria, with food security. An important new tool for lexicographical research sheds additional light on the origins of food sovereignty and also refutes once and for all De Scooter's notion that Mark Edelman was the first researcher who actually used the concept. Google, ever respectful of norms governing intellectual property, usually won't let researchers view all of the pages it has scanned of your books, but it does provide a search tool called the Ngram Viewer that permits them to search for the relative frequency with which particular words or phrases appear in the texts. It is possible as well to explore specific sources that employ the search term within delimited periods. Figures one and two provide a graphical representation of n-gram data for food sovereignty and soberania alimentaria respectively. Both graphs show a steep increase in mentions of the search terms at the end of the 1990s, a reflection of the growing traction at that time of the food sovereignty concept as employed by Via Campesina and its allies. The Spanish graph, however, on the right, shows a significant, though smaller, upturn in the early to mid-1980s. Scrutiny of this data complicates the origin story of food sovereignty still further. In 1983, the government of Mexico announced a new national food program. The acronym is PRONAL. The first objective of PRONAL 
was to achieve food sovereignty, a concept that was understood as more than self-sufficiency in food. It implies national control over diverse aspects of the food chain, thus reducing dependency on foreign capital and imports of basic foods, inputs, and technology. The key factor of this strategy is the adoption of a holistic focus on policies related to the phases of production, transformation, commercialization, and consumption. As with many government programs in Mexico, this one was not adequately funded and ultimately didn't really amount to very much, but the language of food sovereignty uh, clearly comes out of there. While it is beyond the scope of this essay to discuss Pronal in any depth, it is clear that the upward blip in the Spanish graph in the mid-1980s and the smaller rise in the English one is related to this Mexican government program and its rhetoric about soberanía alimentaria. Many researchers writing in English and Spanish, including James Austin, Gustavo Esteva, and Steven Sanderson, among others, use the term in this context. The genealogical complication that this represents for the Via Campesina food sovereignty origin story and its near universal acceptance by scholars is obvious. What is less clear and probably unknowable is whether Mexico exported the language of food sovereignty to <laughs> Central America via mass media or actual contact between peasant movements or other civil society groups or whether the emergence of the term in Central America is a case of simultaneity of invention. How different is food security? In 1996, Via Campesina advanced food sovereignty as an alternative to the FAO's concept of food security. Some analyses describe food sovereignty versus food security as a global conflict, characterized by fundamental antagonisms others as a counterframe or as part of a conflict between models. Raj Patel points out that food sovereignty was very specifically intended as a foil to the prevailing notions of food security. But were these or are these diametrically opposed ideas? Even in the mid-1990s, there were about 200 definitions of food security in published writings. One FAO study sensibly advises that whenever the concept is introduced in the title of a study or its objectives, it is necessary to look closely to establish the explicit or implied definition. A number of those 200 or so definitions overlap substantially with the emerging idea of food sovereignty. And as Patel acknowledges, food sovereignty is overdefined. There are so many versions of the concept, it is hard to know exactly what it means. The concept of food security, according to Flavio Valenci, was first utilized in Europe after World War I. In its origin, it was profoundly linked to the concept of national security and to the capacity of each country to produce its own food so that it would not be vulnerable to possible politically or militarily related sieges, embargoes, or boycotts. Food security was considered part of the human rights agenda as early as the 1943 Hot Springs, Virginia Conference of Allied Governments, which gave rise to the FAO. Three decades later, the 1974 World Food Summit, held in a context of worsening scarcities, narrowed the definition of food security to the availability at all times of adequate world food supplies of basic foodstuffs to sustain a steady expansion of food consumption and to offset fluctuations in production and prices. Notably, this definition focuses on countries and on overall consumption rather than on the household or individual level. During this period, food security became increasingly delinked from human rights concerns and centered instead on production and supply in relation to criteria of physical and nutritional necessity. Over the next two decades, the FAO added additional elements to its definitions, including access for all people, food safety and nutritional balance, and cultural preferences. This new emphasis on consumption and on access by all people, including vulnerable populations, reflected the influential work on entitlements of Amartya Sen. Omawali, among others, has argued that Sen's concept of entitlement constituted a bridge between the structural and human rights approaches to food and development. But entitlement theory also contributed to a shift in food security thinking away from the nation and toward the household or individual as the relevant secure or insecure unit. <clears throat> 
Some of the most frequently cited definitions of food security developed in the 1980s and early 1990s contain elements that figure later in the idea of food sovereignty. Take, for example, Solon Baraklov's definition, developed as part of a study sponsored by the United Nations Research Institute on Social Development. And don't worry, I'm not going to read it to you. You can just look at it. Um, Note the concern with autonomy and self-determination, sustainability, and the protection of the ecological system and equity. <coughs> now compare Via Campesina's original, that is 1996 statement at the Rome World Food Summit. And you can see here they're asserting um, a right to produce food. Uh, which is uh, certainly a novel addition. And they're also mentioning territory, which um, was a term that historically figured in the demands of indigenous people. Uh, but they're not using it in that way. They seem to be using it uh, to refer to nation states. By 2002, with the Rome Plus Five Summit and the formation of the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, a massive coalition of civil society organizations, including Via Campesina, an important shift occurred in the prevailing food sovereignty discourse. In particular, the IPC replaced nation with peoples, communities, and countries in its definition. As Otto Aspes points out, this suggests a pluralistic approach to the question of who is the sovereign. I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. By 2007, the declaration of the Nieleni Forum for Food Sovereignty reduced the scope of sovereignty simply to the peoples. The Nieleni Forum says, food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. Healthy and culturally appropriate food, of course, was already part of earlier FAO definitions of food security. As this and many other examples cited above suggest, in its origins and contemporary expressions, food sovereignty interact, intersects considerably and sometimes even converges with food security. Both have been protean concepts, frequently imprecise, always contested, and in ongoing processes of semantic and political evolution. The question of who is the sovereign in food sovereignty is of crucial importance, since it is inevitably tied to the administration of food sovereignty. Is it the nation state, a region, a locality, or the people, whatever that is? Is the meaning of food sovereignty the same in a giant country such as Canada or a tiny one? If the sovereign unit is a region defined as a local ecosystem that bases its boundaries on ecological parameters like water flow rather than on arbitrary state lines, then how will a relevant constituency be demarcated? What political institutions will administer food sovereignty? How will these differ from existing state institutions? What processes will establish their democratic legitimacy? Another rarely examined question is the meaning of sovereignty itself and its relevance, or the lack of it, in an increasingly globalized world. Rarely examined in the context of the food sovereignty discussion, not, not in general. Food sovereignty advocates face a paradox in as much as efforts to strengthen food sovereignty at the national level inevitably strengthen the states with which they are frequently in an otherwise adversarial relationship. <laughs> Moreover, recent efforts to theorize sovereignty, such as Giorgio Agamben's, commonly hark back to conservative pro-Nazi philosopher Carl Schmitt's hackneyed claim that the sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. People love this for some reason. <laughs> this deeply authoritarian premise would seem to have little to offer democratically minded proponents of food sovereignty. It does, however, point squarely at an issue about which most food sovereignty advocates have been evasive at best, even those who conceive of the present moment as characterized by conflict between models. This is a question of the scope of the food sovereign's power and how it will be consolidated, maintained, and enforced. The ambiguous nature of the sovereign that characterizes most discussions of food sovereignty is suggestive of another set of problems that require specification 
if food sovereignty is to make the leap from appealing slogan to on the ground policy. The idea of food sovereignty draws on a rich set of ideas and practices related to local food sheds, alternative food networks, and the localization of economies as a defense against globalization. These include reducing food miles, promoting direct marketing and geographical origin indications, local sourcing for restaurants and institutions such as schools, universities, hospitals, nursing homes, and prisons, and maintaining green belts around urban areas. Food sovereignty advocates differ as to the role of market forces, though most insist that food is not simply a commodity. They also differ as to the role of long distance and especially international trade in a food sovereign society and have generally been silent on the question of small producers who depend on export production of coffee, cacao, and so on for their livelihoods. Some food sovereignty proponents explicitly call for tariff protections and an end to international trade agreements and financial institutions that interfere with the sovereignty and sustainability of food systems. Imagine for a moment a flourishing small farm in a food sovereign society. It produces a wide variety of high quality foods for nearby markets using sustainable agroecological practices. It does as much of the post harvest processing, patch, packaging, storage and transport as possible in order to capture value added that would otherwise accrue to intermediaries, agro industries and retailers. It pays a living wage and benefits to its hired hands and has an excellent occupational safety and health record. Perhaps it has direct links with urban or other consumers through weekly farmers markets, farm stands, or community supported agriculture groups. It generates significant returns because of its varied production, which minimizes environmental and economic risks and generates year round sales. It's low input and thus low cost technological mix its highly productive workforce, which appreciates the decent treatment, its financial backing from CSA subscriptions rather than commercial lenders, which lowers costs and protects against risks of price fluctuations, foreclosures, bad weather, pests and pathogens, and its savvy marketing strategies, which also create a risk cushion and fuel further demand. It can, of course, reinvest those profits in the existing farm and in its amortization fund and take some as income or worker bonuses. It may also decide that it wants to expand the scale of its operations, purchasing or renting additional land and hiring more workers, or if a cooperative, enlisting more associates. It might even decide that it wants to sell some of its products and markets on the other side of the country or abroad. How does a food sovereign society where the people define their own food and agriculture system handle this type of dizzying success and these kind of aspirations? Like proponents of the many efforts to localize economies in the face of globalization, food sovereignty advocates rarely consider what sort of regulatory apparatus would be needed to manage questions of farm and firm size product and technology mixes and long distance and international trade. Food sovereignty implies limits on all of these. Who would enforce those limits? One of the ironies of posing the question in these terms is that many food sovereignty enthusiasts favor abolishing or diminishing regulation of local trade and of preferred products such as raw milk and raw milk cheeses. In this respect, their vision sometimes converges with that of the detested neoliberals who tend to view all regulation as onerous for business, large and small. Maine farmers don't need inspectors to make sure that they are following good practices, Tony Field and Beverly Bell declare. Keeping their neighbors, families, and longtime customers in good health is an even better incentive. My concern here is with two specific imperatives, limiting farm and firm size and long distance trade, both of which probably imply relatively draconian state control, though of what kind remains little discussed and unclear. It is worth examining briefly, however, the broader gamut of regulatory possibilities that might arguably be implemented in a food sovereign society.
what kinds of control have been tried and what might be learned from these experiences? State level anti-corporate farming laws in the United States have not been notably successful in stalling the advance of giant agribusinesses. And the, these laws exist in almost every major uh, agricultural state in the Midwest and West. The commodities boards that existed in so many countries before the advent of neoliberalism and that still survive in some places in hollowed out form were designed to provide price supports and to regulate foreign trade in a few internationally traded products. Sometimes they were also in charge of supply management and reserves. Even if resources and political will could be mustered to resurrect and revitalize them, they would not likely be capable of administering the complex product mix of highly diversified food sovereign farms or controlling the successful ones that might want to engage in long distance trade or even move into potentially profitable monocultures. Ceilings on farm size, which have been a feature of many agrarian reform programs, might begin to check the consolidation of large properties, but such measures have proven notoriously easy to circumvent through titling by different family members or separate corporate entities. Environmental protection and food safety agencies and non-governmental certifying organizations could conceivably exercise some control over technology and the use of banned substances or practices, but these would require vastly greater resources in order to be effective and to overcome the possible perverse incentives such as cheating with agrochemicals or suborning inspectors. There is no indication that the local food policy councils hailed in some enthusiasts' analyses would be up to any of these daunting enforcement tasks. Some food sovereignty advocates call for confederalism. Michel Pember, for example, says, nurturing and strengthening citizen-centered food systems and autonomy calls for forms of political and social organization that can institutionalize interdependence without resorting to the market or the central state. Confederalism involves a network of citizen groups or councils with members or delegates elected from popular face-to-face -face democratic assemblies in villages, tribes, towns, and even neighborhoods of large cities. In this view, confederalism would, if all goes well, be followed by a linking of federations and confederations that would produce, quote, a significant counterpower to the state and transnational corporations and result in a stage of dual power. This phrase is, of course, redolent of earlier historical experiences that ultimately did not go so well for small farmers. And I suspect the people of my generation here will know what I'm referring to, but <coughs> Lenin used the phrase dual power to refer to the period between February and October of 1917 when the Kerensky government was in power in Russia and Lenin said it was the most democratic government the world had overseen and then proceeded to overthrow it. In an insightful 2008 essay, Boaventura de Souza Santos pointed to a reciprocal myopia that afflicts both the heterogeneous progressive forces that come together in the world's social forums and traditional Marxists. On the one hand, the conventional left parties and the intellectuals at their service have stubbornly not paid any attention to the WSF or have minimized its significance. On the other, the great majority of activists in the WSF, and by extension one might add food sovereignty advocates, have shown contempt for the rich left theoretical tradition and militant disregard for its renewal. In thinking about the limitations of food sovereignty as policy, it is necessary to go beyond Santos' affirmations and recognize that apart from their respective refusals to acknowledge the other, neither group has really grappled with the economic lessons that might be learned from what used to be called actually existing socialism. This failure results in a notable short-sightedness when it comes to thinking through the implications of food sovereignty and particularly the need for strong regulatory oversight of firm size and long distance trade raised above. The centrally planned economies were, and to the extent that they still exist, are notoriously unsuccessful in providing their citizens with basic consumer goods and in particular with sufficient fresh and varied foodstuffs.
The stress and wasted time that people endured in a system that used queuing up rather than purchasing power as the rationing principle for basic goods was arguably an important aspect of the erosion of legitimacy that eventually contributed to those societies' demise. The Achilles heel of the command economies was the plan indicator, a production goal that could be expressed in tons, meters, pairs, for example, shoes, or some other measure or combination of measures. In effect, the center set targets for enterprises and then negotiated its provision of inputs and the manager's delivery obligations. Frequently, this led to hoarding of materials and labor, considerable waste, and absurd outcomes, such as extra heavy sheet metal and pipes, when the indicator was in tons, oversupply of small shoe sizes and undersupply of large sizes, indicator in pairs, or overly bright light bulbs when the indicator was in watts. These results reflected two fundamental unresolvable problems. First, the aggregation for management and planning purposes of impossibly large numbers of discrete products, such as types of light bulbs, sizes, and styles of footwear. And second, the failure of the microeconomic signals from end users to be heard or to correspond to the specific products needed or desired. The conclusion, which some food sovereignty advocates may find lamentable, is first that market mechanisms, even if they frequently generate injustice and inequality, can be especially efficient at delivering a wide product mix to consumers. And second, that micromanaging the consumer goods sector, and particularly the agriculture and food sector, has almost always proven counterproductive. This is not to say that supply management and commodities boards and so on are doomed. Indeed, these or similar mechanisms will be essential for any meaningful version of food sovereignty, but rather to point very specifically to the strong regulatory control that will also be required to localize and domesticate trade and to maintain farm and firm sizes within tolerable bounds. But the onus is on food sovereignty enthusiasts to grapple with the history of the command economies and to come up with creative mechanisms that encourage diversity, that balance and meet the needs of producers and consumers, and that achieve the basic contours of a truly democratic food sovereign production and distribution system. The issues of regulating trade and firm size that are implicit in so much of the food sovereignty literature are rarely acknowledged and have sadly received little or no serious attention. Kim Burnett and Sophia Murphy rightly draw attention to the food sovereignty <coughs> movement's silence on the question of producers who depend, small producers who depend on export crops for their livelihoods and food security. They argue that having such producers shift from sometimes lucrative export crops to low-cost staples for domestic consumption risks exacerbating inequalities by reducing producers' incomes. A related question concerns consumer tastes and needs, even if the latter are not strictly physiological but socially constructed. Sidney Mintz famously analyzed the role of sugar imported from the Caribbean in fueling the workforce that initiated the Industrial Revolution in England. Together with stimulants, first tea and somewhat later coffee, caffeine and sugar became basic necessities in numerous countries where they were not produced. They powered workers, actual and would-be elites, and military machines. They kept innumerable sleep-deprived academics, policymakers, and activists alert during interminable meetings and lectures. <laughs> A food sovereign society could completely eschew these products, but in the event that prohibition of coffee and tea is not politically popular, long distance and international trade is essential for providing them, unless, of course, we contemplate anti-economic greenhouse production of these crops in cold climates. If coffee, tea, and cane sugar have been constructed as necessities, there is also the question of consumer predilections and whims the construction of tastes for non-necessities in a food sovereign society. In Costa Rica in the early 1980s, in the midst of the country's worst economic crisis since the 1930s depression, 
Kiwis from Hawaii suddenly started to appear in supermarkets and upscale neighborhoods, and frequent radio spots extolled the exoticness and deliciousness of this novel fruit. The seductive voice in the radio ads became the butt of comedians' jokes and impressions. The archbishop denounced the squandering of scarce foreign exchange on kiwis and plaintively asked if there was a more delicious fruit in the world than Costa Rican pineapple, which he reminded people was cheap, abundant, and locally produced. He didn't say that it was produced in poisonous monocultures. Um, this implicit plea for a kind of food sovereignty identified one problem but masked another. Food is not just a source of physiologically necessary nutrients, but a major source of pleasure and sociality. Some food sovereignty proponents, such as slow food, make this a central part of their political and culinary practice, but most others, and especially those most concerned with policy, have given this dimension little systematic attention. Consumers in cold northern countries have come to enjoy not only pineapples and kiwis, but an extraordinary cornucopia of perishable tropical fruits and other products, such as chocolate and macadamia nuts and so on. They've come to expect these delicacies all year round. Once they've tasted pineapple or mangoes or acai or bananas, they're unlikely to take kindly to food sovereignty scolds who insist on their consuming only local products during those long northern winters. And I remember as a kid growing up in New York City, the bags of, of plastic bags of mushy, delicious so-called apples that we used to get, that was about it. The, the problem is not just how to reverse tastes constructed over long historical time, something that is probably close to impossible, but also how to build political support for the people democratically exercising control over their food system, that is for food sovereignty. Limiting access to delectable exotic foods is almost certainly a poor road to consensus. An additional related paradox is that food sovereignty as a set of diverse practices has advanced by incremental steps while its advocates typically insist that nothing short of a complete overhaul of food and farming, along with associated changes in values, will be sufficient to reverse the juggernaut of corporate agriculture. Food sovereignty advocates thus find themselves in an interesting and fertile moment. A proliferation of concepts, experiments, and experiences provides abundant material for reflection and for practical efforts to solidify the paradigm on the ground and hopefully to scale it up. At the same time, the almost willful neglect of some key theoretical and policy issues impedes further progress. If we were to imagine not only a successful small farm and a food sovereign society, but a successful food sovereign society built on a dynamic small farm sector, we need to devote considerably more attention to some of the challenges and paradoxes outlined above. Thank you very much. <laughs>